This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. We uh, took to Twitter and asked if you guys had any questions for Eric. And if you'd like to ask a question about next week's show, follow us on Twitter at 83 weeks. That's at 83 weeks. And, uh, you could ask a question. So we're going to hit a few of these reader questions, listener questions, and we'll try to do them rapid fire. Eric, are you ready? I'm ready. Cody Lee writes in, what was he whispering to wrestlers before giving them the scorpion death drop? Of course, <laughs> he's probably trying to make them laugh in real life, but was there supposed to be a storyline piece behind him occasionally whispering at the guy before he hits him with the death drop? Not a storyline piece. I think it was just something that, again, improv, you know, good part of everything that you saw back then was some very, very talented people, you know, improving because they thought it would enhance the moment and the character. Uh, Barry McFeely writes after the quite literally insane, deafening pop sting got taking out all the NWO at the end of March's uncensored pay-per-view. Did you question holding until Starcade, or is that what made you hold until Starcade? Uh, and, and the, the answer is neither. Um, had no doubt holding to Starcade was a good idea, uh, nor was it the impetus behind it. And we were kind of already committed. Let me ask you, you've said before, I've always thought, Hey, Starcade is, is WCW's hallmark event. And you and even Tony Schiavone have both said, well, really it was probably Halloween havoc. Was there ever consideration to maybe move it up and have him do it at Halloween havoc in Las Vegas? No, and the reason why it's such a, oh, I don't even know the word for it. it. It was an instinct. You know, Sting was about as much of an icon, a WCW icon, as Flair. Not quite as much. Flair was the guy. But right below Flair was Sting. And because Starcade was historically, at least, one of our biggest pay-per-views or one of our our, our, our longest-running tent poles, maybe traditional tent poles, and because Sting was traditionally a WCW guy, that was the reason why I picked Starcade. It just seemed to fit better than Halloween Havoc. Ha- Halloween Havoc didn't need it. Halloween Havoc was already doing really, really well <clears throat> as a tent pole. Uh, it, it kind of had its own character, so to speak, uh, Starcade, not so much. So I think the, the idea was to hold it off to Starcade because of that, because of the history and the lineage and Sting's relationship with WCW. And also because Starcade needed something that Halloween Havoc didn't. Sean Wolford writes in, did you ever consider having Sting work major market house show matches against members of the NWO to build towards Starcade? Nope. And nope. in hindsight, major market house shows. Do you think that would have been a good idea or nope? Okay. Nope. Number one, we didn't need it. We were printing money. Sure. You were selling out either way, I guess is your point. Yeah. We were printing money. We were selling out without him. Um, when I talked earlier in this episode about discipline and building mystique, that's a part of it. You've, you've got to be able to abandon the formula to a certain degree. In this case, we had to abandon the formula that we would normally use partly, and we could afford it because we didn't need it. But if you're going to commit, commit, don't kind of commit, don't compromise. And that's one of the reasons the angle worked and the story worked and the character worked because we didn't compromise it for short-term gain. It certainly wouldn't have done nothing, anything to satisfy people all over the country in major markets by by giving them something in you know in a live house show and then basically giving them something similar on a pay-per-view that you were building towards. So I I think to manage the mystique and to maintain the mystique, the decision was a good one. I think the question was more to help Sting maybe work off some ring rust. Well, I mean that's a very good question and I'm sorry I, I interpreted it incorrectly. No, that in hindsight, could that have been a good idea? It would have compromised the character. So in a sense, I probably wouldn't have done it anyway. Would it have worked off the ring rust? Sure. But Steve's problem wasn't ring rust. Right. I got you. All right. That's, 
it wasn't the issue. We'll move along. Will Coxon writes in hindsight, did the fact that the WCW locker room came to the ring when Sting beat Hogan and the fact that Sting jumps into the waiting arms of the giant kind of ruin his character. He sort of loses that. You can stick it attitude with me when he does that. What say you? I agree. Spontaneous moment that worked against us. He can't, and I'm not critical. I'm not critical. You know, an argument could be made, I guess, creatively. I'm not buying it, but it could be made that it's time for that crow, scary sting character to hang it up and become the aversion of his previous character. Cause he finally put a stake through the heart of the, you know, the vampire meaning the NWO. He finally did what he accomplished after all those, after all that time and all those challenges and all the obstacles thrown in his way, all of the things that put him at risk, the stakes were high. He finally, he won, he achieved his goal. So arguably, I guess someone could make the case that it makes a little bit of sense. 2020 hindsight. Mm, I would have preferred not. Just so our listeners understand what Sting's contract, we talked earlier about how he was the number two merchandise seller. What Sting's contract allowed him to participate in that, or was that all inclusive of his guarantee? Oh, God, this is horrible, but I don't really remember. I just, I hate making shit up. And sure. I hate no problem. swerving the audience, but I, I think I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take a, a whack at it, but I think there were percentages involved, but much, much lower than WWE. I think there was participation, but a much lower participation as a result of the guaranteed contracts. Let's talk about bats. Kevin Albus wants to know, were there always prop bats or gimmick bats, or sometimes did you use real bats? Sometimes we use real bats. In fact, we didn't start using prop bats until, you know, some of our shows started turning into bat fests. (laughs) <laughs> and, and then and then you had to or you're going to be killing people C Jerk J wants to know did you have Sting work out at the power plant to prepare for his main event with Hulk Hogan no All right. and, uh, I mean I'll I'll go back to what I said earlier sure um, no <laughs> there's a lot of uh, debate and I don't know that it could really be argued I think most people think about all the great moments in Sting's career and they would maybe point to different matches. But Sting's best year is probably 1997 and he had one fucking match or two. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Amazing. Remarkable. Just shows you what can be done if you have a great imagination and you're committed and disciplined and you get lucky (laughs) and all the things that go into success. It's not one thing. It's really not. I wish it was because it would be so much easier and there'd be so much, so much more success. Um, but you know, some, it, it, it's a great idea. It's, it's original ideas. It's planning, it's execution, it's timing. So much of it is timing, which I refer to as luck, but you know, you've talked a lot timing. on the show about how, how, uh, Kevin Sullivan booked heat. Uh, what, what role did he play in the West sting was booked in 97. I mean, it was certainly part of it, you know, but I mean, hard to, hard to kind of quantify it. Sure. I'll, I'll qualify it by saying, yes, he was definitely a part of the process, but was he 75% of it, 20% of it, 10% of it? Guess what? Any, any given week it could change. You know, we were all on that boat, everybody. The talented, you know, Sting and Hulk and Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and any a number of talents, you know, Savage, Page, everybody was involved, and any one of them could have come up with an idea that trumped any, everybody else's. And in that particular week, I saw that was, yeah. could have been he could have been eighty percent of all the creative in that particular week. And the next week, he didn't even show up. So it depends. I would say across the board, Kevin didn't have a lot to do with the NWO angle as far as the conceit of it, the idea of it, the original premise of it. Um, in fact, not, nothing to do with it at all. Um, but what Kevin did do, and, and I think if it was up to Kevin Nash, when I talked to Kevin, I was in Qatar with Qatar, not Cutter, 
Mucker Feathers guitar um, with Kevin. And we, you know, we talked for a couple hours and we talked about Kevin Sullivan a lot. And Kevin is a big fan. Kevin Nash is a big fan of Kevin Sullivan's and felt that had it not been, cause you know, we had a chance to spend hours kind of looking back and Nash felt, um, that had it not been for Kevin Sullivan and his ability to manage the talent. And by manage the talent, I mean, giving them, you know, emotional and psychological aspirins to get through the fact that the entire formula was being turned upside down and on its head and that the baby faces weren't getting comebacks. And at least in the very beginning and the, the crucial, you know, evolution of the NWO story, it took a lot of convincing and, counseling and handholding and babysitting and cocktails and all kinds of other things to get talent through the fact that the formula that they've been using throughout their entire careers at that point was now being thrown out the window and anarchy rules and convincing them that eventually the baby faces will make their comeback. Not next week, not next month, maybe next year. And that was a that was a tough pill to get a lot of talent to swallow because they were completely, they were on um, on firm ground, you know there was no terra firma anywhere near them. They were walking in quicksand every single week when they showed up because the formula, their experience, all the things that they learned was, in many respects, being tossed out the window and they were being asked to learn a new psychology. Valentine Michaels writes in: Did WCW ever get a cease and desist from Miramax for Sting's makeup being an exact copy of the Crow makeup? We probably would today. Sure. Fast forward if it was, you know, if the NWO and every aspect of it was, you know, being revealed today. You could probably get <clears throat> a couple dozen lawsuits from a bunch of different people. But fortunately, it was 1997 and we didn't have that issue. It's uh, it's so weird to think how much of this is just great timing, too, because really, if you think about it, given what we know, the tragedy is going to be with Owen Hart. You know, had that happened before this crow character, he never would have been in the rafters to begin with. Um, I doubt that you, you think maybe you still would have, we did. We, 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 we dropped staying out of the rafters after Owen Hart. I just don't think it would have been as often as I guess my point, it was a staple there for a while where it felt like every single week afterwards. You know what? You know what? I think though, Conrad, we, we wouldn't have not done it, but I don't think the audience would have been as excited about it. Yeah. I don't mean that, that, is, I don't mean that the risk changed. I just mean, you know, from a, from a, I don't know, sensibility standpoint, maybe it's not the right thing. I don't, uh, we weren't there and I don't, I certainly don't mean any disrespect to, to Owen Hart's family or, or, or any heart for that matter. Um, but when somebody gets killed on a NASCAR track, when Dale Earnhardt senior got killed on a NASCAR track. Yes, they made modifications. Helmets changed. There was an analysis done, but people didn't stop driving. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we did the same. We certainly, you know, double checked and, you know, reevaluated what we were doing for safety issues as a result, much like NASCAR did, but we didn't stop doing it. But I do think your point had timing been different, and it's hard for me even to talk about this, but if the Owen Hart situation would have happened early in 97, even though we may have continued doing it, I think the audience would have reacted adversely to it. Yeah. It, it, at the very least, it wouldn't have been something that they would, they got nearly as excited about as they did. There's lots of questions about, you know, staying that day. And I, don't, I know we've sort of tiptoed around some stuff. So uh, we'll try to answer this however we can, but Brian Darby writes, considering sting did not repel from the ceiling, nor did he go over cleanly. I've heard there were outside of the ring issues. I have to ask, in your opinion, did sting arrive to Starcade intoxicated? No. Yeah. I've never heard that. That's not it. That was that not out. it. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with it. And if I've ever said anything to imply it, I want to make it clear right now. Um, I didn't mean that that was not. The issue. It was a personal issue, yeah. not related to drugs or alcohol. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. 
Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.